Welcome to our online community. We do pray that wherever you are listening from, that you're able to take the time to sit still and hear from God's Word today. We come to you from Highlands Presbyterian Church. We also ask that you give us feedback on our online services. Enjoy the message for today. Greetings, saints, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, welcome to a sermon entitled, Dissecting the Cross. And we're going to be looking at the purpose of the cross. We're in the season of Easter, and we're looking at why did Jesus have to die? What happened 2,000 years ago? How is it relevant to us as the church today? So I'm going to read from the book of Luke 24, from verse 36, all the way through to verse 52. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe in it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What a wonderful scripture and assurance about what happened. And uh, we catch this story just after Jesus had appeared to the disciples on the road uh, to Emmaus, and that they had seen him, he had convinced them that he is alive, and they ran and told the other disciples. And then while they're in the midst of this whole thing, Jesus suddenly appears to them. And it's quite interesting that we discover, to begin with, the propensity, the human propensity for unbelief. The first thing that comes to them, even though they were hearing a testimony about Jesus having appeared to the other disciples, was unbelief. And unbelief manifests essentially in two ways. It can manifest in fear, or it can manifest in a false sense of unworthiness. And I'm going to talk about that quickly. The first thing we see here with the disciples was fear. They thought it was a ghost, and they were afraid. They doubted. They ran to fear. But saints, we must understand that fear is, should not be our default setting. In, in fact, God looks at fear and cowardice with great seriousness. Let's read in Revelation 21 verse 8 the consequences of fear before the Lord. And it says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And saints, this is how seriously God looks at fear. That's why even Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. Fear is not a godly thing. And here in the, in the scripture we just read, fear is one of the sins that will send people directly to hell. It is clustered together with fornication. It is clustered together with witchcraft. Because when people think of fear, they think, well, it's just a minor thing. It's not something big. 
I'm not like a witch or I'm not like an, an adulterer. I'm not like all these things. But God looks at someone who is fearful, not trusting God, not trusting his word, just like he looks at someone who is a witch or a Satanist. And the destiny is the same. So saints, we have to be careful that we have a fear that does not come from God, but is actually of the devil. And you know, the other manifestation of unbelief, like I said earlier on, is a false sense of of unworthiness the devil wants you to feel unworthy and it actually you actually think it's a godly thing to feel unworthy the bible says initially they didn't believe because of fear then they jumped straight into the other ditch which was not believing because of joy and they said this is too good to be true and that again saints that can be a trap where you think no this is so good i don't deserve such a level of goodness but that is a false sense of unworthiness and we have to be aware of the yes we are called to walk in humility but not false humility or false unworthiness. And how do you know that the sense of unworthiness or humility you are going through is false? Well, this is uh, the key thing. False humility and false unworthiness will cause you to rebel against the word of God. Now, here they were expressing a sense of low self-esteem, unworthiness. But what did it do? It caused them to doubt what he had told them, that he's the Messiah, that he was going to rise again from the dead. Inasmuch as they were uh, from a joyous point of view, but even that sense of unworthiness if it's false can cause you to rebel against god and is just as bad as any other sin god wants us to trust him why because the grace of god nullifies any sense of unworthiness we have hebrews 4 verse 14 to 16 i won't read it but it says because jesus is our sympathetic high priest we can approach the throne of grace with confidence at any time now i'm, now I'm summarizing there which means it's no longer about us it's about what christ has done and the grace of God nullifies any sense of unworthiness because when we continue to dwell on how worthy we unworthy we are and how the gospel is too good we're actually mocking the power of the blood of Jesus Christ imagine a little child who is hungry and famished and the mother prepares a lovely meal and the child looks and says oh mom you've cooked such a nice meal it looks so good smells so good but I don't want to ruin it it's too good to ruin that's missing the point it's meant to be eaten it's meant to be ruined the grace of god is there because we are dirty and we run to it we don't run away from god we run to him and he cleanses us but the next thing i want to talk about which is amazing in spite of uh, the disciples unbelief and fear if i had been jesus i think i would have wanted to slap them on the back of the head and say guys i've been with you three and a half years i've walked with you you've seen the miracles i've taught you daily in public in private you've seen me do all these things i've taught you how to pray and you still don't believe guys you are worthless and you're not worthy worthy of, of the bother but not jesus jesus was patient and gracious with them because the lord's default setting is salvation over condemnation it's mercy over judgment the Lord will always err more on the side of being patient with us. That's why it says in John 3, 16 to 17, the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. All those who believe in him will be saved. Jesus would rather save than condemn. The last thing he wants to do is condemn, and that's his nature, saints, and that's the wonderful Savior we have who went to the cross for us, and he expresses mercy for us. And he is so determined to see us through this Christian journey as long as we are willing for instance colossians 1 verse 22 to 23 i won't read it again i'll encourage you to go and check it out it talks about how god has cleansed us and made us without fault and will see us through to the end without fault as long as we continue believing now we just have to be willing to stay the course and then he gives us the strength to see us through again hebrews 12 2 says jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith what a wonderful wonderful thing because look to be honest we can't do it without him anyway we may realize and be frustrated at our propensity for fear our propensity for unbelief our propensity for false right false unworthiness and self-righteousness whatever those things and you get frustrated and you say ah why do i keep doing these things and the disciples must have been a bit frustrated with themselves as well when they realized this but saints, only Jesus can deliver us from our own weakness and our own fear and our own propensity for unbelief because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And the Bible says there in Luke 24, where we read verse 45, that he opened their eyes 
for them to understand scripture. So Jesus is the one who can open our eyes to see how we can overcome that stubborn flesh, that stubborn fear, that stubborn sense of unworthiness. He can open our eyes, but the key is he does it through scripture. So you also have to be de dedicated, committed to reading his word because the Bible says he opened their eyes to understand scripture. What's he going to use? He's going to use scripture. It's no use praying and, and beating yourself up and saying, God, I'm unworthy. God, I'm not good and I keep missing the mark and you're not reading your Bible. Because Jesus will use the Bible to open your eyes. The Bible, the word of God is the raw material that God uses for your transformation. So your part, read that word. Even if you don't understand it, read it. Read a chapter a day systematically and pray. And God at the right time will quicken it and help you to understand it. And of course, we have got teachers and preachers who can help us understand. But you must be committed to studying the word. And then the next thing I want to talk about is that all scripture ultimately must and does point to Jesus Christ. And Jesus here talks, talks to them. And remember, in the passage we read, he said to the disciples that the prophets, the Psalms, um, the law, all of it pointed to Jesus Christ, his coming, his righteousness, his grace, uh, his sacrifice, the redemptive power. All scripture must point to Jesus Christ. Like there is a saying that all roads lead to Rome and uh, all truth leads to Jesus. Anything that is truly truth must ultimately lead to Jesus Christ. Like the law of gravity, if something comes up, it must come down. So if any scripture must be read, it must come down to Jesus. It must point to Jesus. And I'm going to read one scripture where Jesus again points to this in the book of John chapter 5 verse 37 to verse 40. And as he is talking to some stubborn Jews who are refusing to believe in him. And verse 37 he says, And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe in the one he sent. You diligently study scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me and have life. And so Jesus is saying to the Jewish, the Jewish people who were there that, look, no matter how diligently you study scriptures, and I've just talked about how you have to commit yourself to scripture, but if that scripture does not ultimately lead you to see Jesus, some dimension of Jesus, it's actually a false revelation. Because all scripture ultimately is a dimension of Christ. Either he's talking about his grace, he's talking about his nature, or he's talking about his righteousness, or he's talking about his sacrifice for us, or he's talking about his promises for us. All scripture in some form or manner is pointing to Jesus. There are images and shadows. For instance, in the Bible, the Passover lamp, what happened at the Passover, the Exodus, was pointing to Jesus and how his blood would actually set us free. And then they were saved by the blood of the lambs that they post that they put on the on the doorposts and the angel of death didn't come in and that was foreshadowing how jesus when we trust in his blood the angel of death of eternal death would pass over us and not kill us many images of jesus when uh, abraham was about to to sacrifice isaac and there was a lamb that suddenly a ram that suddenly appeared and instead of killing his son isaac the ram took its place and again foreshadowing Jesus that he would take our place. When we should die, Jesus would die in our place so that we could have life eternal. Full of many images, the line of the tribe of Judah, the seed of Abraham. All scripture saints ultimately is some expression of Jesus Christ. So if you want to understand scripture, one easy way is ask yourself, what is this scripture showing me about Jesus Christ? Then the last thing saints I want to talk about is the gospel protocol. And I love this last section in Luke 24 where Jesus begins to explain now we are really dissecting the cross. The purpose of Jesus' journey on earth. The purpose of him suffering on the cross. And the Bible says when he was talking about how all these things, the Psalms, the prophets, the law pointed to Jesus Christ, he said that the first of all the Christ, the Messiah, would suffer. So he is telling us the mark of his messiahhood, what a messiah would do. Many people today think about and talk about messiahs and look for messiahs. And the messiah uh, in people's minds must be very strong, maybe must be very rich and must be do wonderful things. They must be uh, elevated above everyone else and they must stand out. 
But Jesus defines his Messiah by dying for his people. Today, with many people, many leaders, whether in politics or in religion, who don't want to die for the people, they want the people to die for them, and they exploit them, and they take things from them, and they hurt them, they abuse them, they betray them, and all these things. But Jesus did the opposite, which is why he is the true and only Messiah, because he gave his life for us. And that's the first thing he talks about, that he had to suffer. So the Messiah would, could not manifest without suffering. And we need to thank the Lord's saints. He suffered for us. He paid a price for us. He was beaten. The cat of nine tails, ripping apart his back, hanging on that cross where he could barely breathe and barely talk. And the pain of the nails, the pain of the rejection of people around him, the shame of him being naked in front of all the people that he had preached to and healed. He had to suffer. He suffered, saints. We must not lose sight of this. And he talked about this, how he had to suffer. And what would happen when you'd suffer? The first thing he said, there would be repentance. And then there would be forgiveness of sins. And people often rush to the issue of how Jesus died for our forgiveness. But before there is forgiveness, there is repentance. He says, so that you can preach repentance and then forgiveness of sins can take place. So you cannot be a child of God. You cannot be forgiven. You cannot experience eternal life. You cannot walk into the promises of God before you go through the process of repentance. Any true forgiveness by God in our lives is always preceded by repentance. And what is repentance, saints? It is confessing your sin and renouncing it. You know, Proverbs, I believe it might be Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and renounces his sin, and that's repentance, will find mercy. So repentance has two key things. There's confession. Ag confession means agreeing with God what he says about your sin. If he says homosexuality is wrong, you agree with him. If he says fornication is wrong, you agree with him. If you say you need to forgive, you agree with him. Whatever he says, you agree with and you say it with your mouth and you agree with him and say, God, I'm agreeing with you about your standard for righteousness. And then you need to renounce, you turn away from those sins. So it's not enough to just confess it. You need to turn and Jesus is there as the author and the perfecter of your faith to help you. But when you repent, the Bible says the next thing that comes is you are forgiven and your record of sin is washed away. And then it says when this happens, Jesus says you will be, he didn't say you may, you will be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem to all nations. And the gospel is for all nations. You see, and that's a wonderful thing. The gospel is not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Israelites. Jesus himself said, and this gospel will be preached to all nations, regardless of whether you are black, you are Indian, or you are colored, whatever race you see yourself, whatever ethnicity, your background, your class, whether you have money or you don't have money, this gospel is for all people. Mercy, repentance for all people. What a wonderful thing did for us. He, Jesus did for us on the cross. And we witness to this, that Jesus did this for all of us. But it's important, saints, here, that we witness by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he gave them the instruction there that wait for that which my father is going to send you. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. That you need to wait for the Holy Spirit, then you can witness. The Holy Spirit, saints, empowers us to live a godly life. He empowers us to be bold so that we can preach even to our relatives, whom we think are skeptical and you are embarrassed to preach to your relatives, you are embarrassed to preach to your workmates. Perhaps you need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit if you haven't asked God to fill you and to empower you. Jesus spoke about it as of first importance. He actually told them, wait, don't go witnessing until you are clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. So ensure that you have the power of the Holy Spirit, which is another sermon in itself. And the last point I want to talk about is the blessing as the last word. You know, Jesus was taken up right before them. And what strikes me, because what a person does just before they go, often is one of the most important things to them. In Shona, we have a saying, In other words, even to the very last time, the last moment you have with a child, you need to be instructing them. It's important. You can never instruct them enough. And what was Jesus doing when he was taken up to heaven? The Bible says he was busy blessing them. And Jesus, once he blesses, he speaks life over us. He speaks forgiveness. He speaks regeneration. He speaks a new mind. He speaks a new heart. He speaks hope. Saints, what is your disposition? When you relate with people, what is the last thing you want to do? What is the last word you give to your children before they go off to school? What is the last word you say to your spouse before she goes off to work? What is the last thing you say to your neighbor before they go to sleep? 
Is it you curse them and you say how worthless they are and how they are hopeless and how they will never change? But that's not the way we should do it, saints. The last word with us must always be a blessing. Even uh, Paul, I believe in Romans, talked about this and he said, bless and do not curse. Saints, we need to bless. Bless our nation. Bless our continent. There are many things happening. Now, I'm not saying we gloss over the negative things that are happening. We don't lie. Blessing is not speaking a lie. But it's just speaking God's truth and God's mind over a situation. What God wants and what God wants to see. And speaking it and saying, God, this is what you establish. Your righteousness, your goodness, your love, your mercy, life, and not death. And that is what we're called to speak, saints. So, saints, I pray that this sermon has been meaningful. It has helped us to dissect the cross a little bit. Why Jesus had to die. Why we celebrate. Now, many people don't even say Easter. We talk about Passover because it's more meaningful when we say Passover. Saints, this is the purpose of this all. The purpose of the gospel. So be blessed and dwell. Continue to dwell on the truth of the cross. The wonder, the goodness of the cross through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you would have a great week knowing that God your Father is with you every step of the way.